All right, y'all, welcome back to Comet Arms Channel. Okay, so today we're gonna be talking about 9-11. Now, I always think, I always wanna say it's that time of the year again. I feel like that's not the right expression just because people generally say that when, you know, a little bit more festive way or a little bit peppier, um, but obviously this is not the occasion for, for that. But it is something that comes into my mind um, every year, this time of the year, uh, and that's kind of for good reason. Again, I think, and a lot of Americans or a lot, even a lot of people um, around the world my age uh, will have a very similar mindset as me if they're in the military and they've been able to sort of experience this or see these terrorist attacks as they were unfolding. Now, at the time, I was only seven years old, so I was pretty young, generally younger than other people I talked to um, in the service about that topic because they'll usually tell me how 9-11 motivated them to join the military pretty much like right after it happened because they were a little bit older they were able to do that obviously i was seven i couldn't just you know go up and, and join the military but it was a very very big motivator for getting me to want to join the military because again i wanted to be one of those individuals to help prevent this stuff from happening in the future because it was so ingrained in my memory i think if you're if you're six or older if you're if you were six or older when it happened um, you generally have some sort of story to tell. And with my 9-11 story, if you want to call it that, it revolves specifically around one individual, and that was my aunt. Um, and that's because she actually worked at the engineering department of the Port Authority, New York, New Jersey, on the, I think it was the 82nd floor of one of the, the towers. So she worked in the World Trade Center. Now, we were living in New Jersey at the time, so she would commute to New York City. Now, when I think of those specific images of, you know, the North Tower being on fire, my brothers and I watching everything on, you know, my mom's bedroom television, and then obviously my mom being very upset, we're, we're seeing these images through a filter of what my aunt must have been experiencing because we didn't know if she was safe. We knew she worked there, but we had no idea if she was safe or anything like that. So, you know, you can imagine people are going to be expecting the worst. Um, so obviously my mom was pretty upset. I remember that very vividly. And I remember my aunt coming back and obviously that big relief of everybody understanding that, you know, she made it out of there okay. But we never, at least I never really understood what had happened that day, at least, you know, from her perspective. Because while I'm seeing everything through a lens and trying to interpret it, you know, my way, like what she must have been going through, I never really heard that story. So that's what this video is about today, talking with my aunt and sort of trying to understand and, and hear how everything was going down from her perspective. Somebody that had worked there, somebody that had, you know, she she knew several people that didn't make it out of the towers. You know, it's it's almost unreal to think of somebody who has such a personal connection to that area and those individuals and, you know, being able to, hear their perspective uh, it's not an easy thing to share for sure um so uh, i definitely appreciate her being able and being willing to share that with me because again it is a very personal thing um but again it's just something that i've always thought about so i i did really want to talk to her and sort of um, see how things were from her perspective but i will say um it's definitely not easy to hear hearing anyone's sort of personal accounts on 9 11 um, is not easy to hear. And this was definitely no different with uh, her level of connection to the World Trade Center. But yeah, I hope you all will be able to appreciate how difficult it must be to share this personal account, especially, you know, being willing to provide it um, for, you know, the channel and, and share it with the public. Yeah, it's definitely not an easy thing. Um, but yeah, without further ado, this is my on story. To get to 9-11, I don't even know where to begin. The funny thing is, I loved that job at the World Trade Center. I can't even tell you how much I loved it. I was always there by 20 to 8. I, my day started at 8. Because I wanted that extra 20 minutes to have my coffee and my bagel and just uh, glance through the paper. So I had that 20 minutes to myself. That morning, I woke up. And I was so tired as if I had been on some kind of sleeping pill. I remember telling Patty, Patty, I want to go back to sleep. Uh, I'm so tired. She says, what time do you want me to wake you up? I, don't, I said, I don't know, an hour or two. And I went back to sleep. Now, that, that lateness 
And that documentary that I mentioned, it so happened that that happened to a few, I don't know if it was a few hundred or a few thousand people that felt so tired that didn't want to get up and go to work. And because I was late, I was not in the building. So when I got to West 4th Street, which was around 9.30 or 10, the train had stopped. It just stopped at West 4th. And I see a bunch of people on the platform all talking, talking, talking. I didn't know nothing. Finally, that one train starts moving. And it didn't go to the World Trade Center. It went to a stop or two before that. So I stayed on the train. I got off at that stop. I, I think Broadway. And when I went up the stairs and I came out, it was just like a ton of people coming toward me. And I said, what happened? What happened? And they said the, the planes hit the World Trade Center. And I was in shock. From that moment on, I was in, sh I was in shock. It, it, it was just unbelievable. Um, I started walking toward the building because Sandy, she worked on, uh, she worked a few blocks away and I was just going to, you know, get in touch with her. Something told me, don't go, just turn around and go back home. Well, that was a trip in itself. I ended up anyway getting back home around four. But the thing is, as I was standing a few blocks away from the World Trade Center and I could hear all the glass breaking and from what I could see, I thought I saw either furniture or people coming out of the of the of the upper floors. It was people jumping out. It was people jumping out is what it was. Anyway, so that's, I ended up getting back on a, a bus, uh, a train on a bus, and I ended up home at about four o'clock. Patty and Marianne, our best friend, the school crossing guard, oh, I don't know if you know, remember her, a little, um, when I saw them, we started crying. And the first thing I said was, oh my God, all those people, all those people that were trapped in there that were told to go back into the building. Had I been in the building, I don't listen to people. I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a free thinker in that way. I would have known to get out. Um, that's my feeling. And so basically, I escaped that whole thing. Uh, the trip home was another little thing, but but that's right. how I got home. Was there was a after I got that one trip that one train, it took us to like where the ferries are. And the ferries were, sh were shipping people across the, the river. We got to the Meadowlands, and we, there was just like thousands of people on the Meadowlands, on the floor, on the ground. The Meadowland people brought out vats and vats of water, soda. I was sitting there, not a peep out of anyone. Everyone was in shock. A person behind me, I could hear somebody talking about, I have a van and I'm going to Little Falls. Does anybody need a ride? That's how I got my ride. I was lucky the whole day, the whole day from the moment I woke up. A coworker of mine, Peggy, she, I was told that she made it to the lobby and her son was on the phone with her and he say, mom, mom, hurry up, get out, get out. Uh, son, I'm, I'm, I'm in the lobby, I'm almost out. And the building came down on her. She never made it out. That was her. That was her, Peggy. And there were 77 people that in my, uh, at the uh, engineering department that died. Um, around six of them I worked with on a daily basis. They, never, they didn't make it, and I did. I was, uh, I was a, a kind of an early bird. I mean, I normally went to sleep 10, 11 o'clock, and I woke up. I'm a, a, I'm a morning person. I could go to sleep at 1 or 2 and still get up at 5 or 6 without an alarm clock. I never needed an alarm clock my whole life. So that morning, I didn't feel like that at all. I felt like I had t been drugged, like I had taken uh, some kind of sleeping pill. I just wanted to go back to sleep. And she called in sick. I Sandy know. called in sick. Hi. Sandy called in I had gotten up that day. I was, I was working at one Battery Park Plaza. It was about four blocks away from the World Trade Center. And I had just started a new paralegal job in the, at One Battery Park Plaza. That morning, I woke up, it was a beautiful day. I showered, I got ready, I was ready to leave for work and something told me, do not go to work. I called my mom, it was about 10 to nine. When I called, I got my boss on the phone, he was already at the job. 
And she was like, oh my God, a plane just hit the building. Like at that point, she didn't really know what it, what was actually going on. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not coming in today. I'm sick. You know, I'm not feeling well. And then about an hour later, I was in Brooklyn. I smelled ash and smoke in Brooklyn. There was ashes and everything coming in my neighborhood from that whole thing. And uh, so that's that's her story. That's I mean, my story. I was never there. Something told me not to go in that day, and I just didn't go in. There were no phones working. There were no phones. Nothing was working. There was Grandma. one phone. Grandma. There was one phone. I made it to the Times, the Times Magazine, the Times newspaper. They let me in there. They wanted to know my story, and I said, I have no story. I was late. Can I use your phone? I called my mommy, and I asked mommy to call her, and she never did. I thought she Terry freaking was never. She, she didn't call her. She was in shock that I had made, you know. I thought, uh, she, got, I I thought still she died. Here. Yeah, so I'm sorry that I don't have a more dramatic. I mean, I know people that do have. I haven't been in touch with them in a long time, but, you know, the with, with the... Look, the engineers that were going down the stairs from the 82nd floor, it took them, I don't know, an hour. I mean, their lives were really hanging by minutes. So they, they were my friends. I, which we, I talked to them. They walked down from the 82nd floor very slowly while the firemen were going up. I, you know how many firemen lost their lives, police officers, but the firemen, I'll always honor firemen i think more than anything else they they you know they, i they, think that they knew they were doomed when they got there and saw the scene how are you going to put out a fire in but 82nd they still, floor but it, but it was the it, honor it was the honor of the firemen that went up there even when they knew that it was a there was no way they were going to stop that you know what i mean so that's another that's another thing uh, the firemen rather i think that honor. people ought to remember them and what they did so that's my story. I, I, it was just, um, and I don't really talk about it with anyone, you know. Um, it's, it's to me, it's, it's, it's sacred what happened that day, and for me to um, try to get, I don't know, sympathy or oh God, you worked at the World Trade or anything like that is um, dishonoring those people that died.